turn on my screen share then. These are um, loose slides. There will be more talking than probably written stuff on the slides, but um, they'll help maybe guide the conversation. So, okay. Well, thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I know I've shared little bits of information with folks over the years, and uh, this is a kind of a nice time to pull all of the thoughts together um, into to one place. So uh, it was cool. Um, do you want me to officially get started then? Yes? Cool. Um, so first things first, I have titled this A Peek Behind the Hiring Curtain because I want to talk about recruiting and kind of the mindset of recruiters and hiring people. Um, but also I was in some sort of absolutely wild mind space and in my head I was making hiring rhyme with iron and so this is supposed to be like a reference to a peek behind the iron curtain which feels really um not okay today but also somehow appropriate and I don't know it's been a loopy couple of weeks right so <laughs> main goal right now is to talk about how finding a job is stressful in the best of times um, and this year has in a lot of ways been the worst of times. Um, and then especially when it comes to hiring and finding new jobs, it's been a really interesting time for both the recruiters and people who are doing the hiring, but also people who are out on the market. Um, when it comes to looking for jobs and when it comes to that job search, a lot of us um, haven't thought of it since the last time we looked for a job, and sometimes that's five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and I would say even that like every market works a little bit different in how their hiring kind of plays out. And so the information we have from that five, 10, 20 years ago might be a little bit out of date. So I'm hoping today to kind of clue you in um, to some of the more kind of modern or current hiring practices um, and stuff will, for the most part, come from the context of um, software engineering, tech, startup, uh, that kind of market across the country, but a lot of it does kind of stem from the Bay Area. So a lot of this is going to be from the perspective of, um, uh, if you think about it in the, the terms of like um, knowledge workers, right? So this is kind of the hiring practices behind knowledge workers versus um, you know, blue collar workers or something like that. That is, that is definitely a different market and there are different, different rules there. So with all of that said, my goal and hope today is to um, talk to you about how recruiting works, what's going through your recruiter's mind when they are talking with you. I also wanna bust some of the common assumptions that candidates make and some of the misconceptions about the hiring process and then share some tips to kind of work around those assumptions and misconceptions and hopefully um, for anyone who is looking for a job or who any, anyone who may be looking for a job or knows someone who's looking for a job, you can help them with some of these tips. So with that, I will do a little bit of an update. Um, most of you know me, but why am I talking about this? Um, right now I'm the head of people and operations at Verge Genomics, which is a biotech in the Bay Area. Um, and I run our talent acquisition, our hiring, our people, operations are employee engagement, like all of the internal HR type things you would think about. Um, previously, I worked as a director of training at Think. Think was a full service recruiting firm. Um, we worked with more than 100 uh, startups across the country, helping them build their early teams. And my job was to train the 150 plus recruiters that we had there. So I know the process um, well enough to be able to teach other people to do it. Um, and then I've also done a little bit of hiring myself for people on my team. And then more personally this year, I kind of am now on the other side of things uh, because COVID-19 did impact Bank in a big way and I was laid off in March. And so I my, found myself looking for a job after eight years and kind of going, oh man, I'm out of practice on this side of things. I don't know what's going on. So I'll try to sprinkle in perspectives both from the hiring side, but also from the, the applicant um, candidate side. So. That's a little bit me and why we're gonna do this or why I'm gonna talk about it. Um, the first thing to think about is, when, is to understand how recruiting works. And so when we think about how recruiting works, um, the first thing to recognize is that there's two different types of recruiters. There are internal recruiters and external recruiters and how they think 
is going to be different. What, what they're motivated by is going to be different and how they work with you is going to be different. Internal recruiters are employed by the company directly. They get a paycheck from company X that you are applying to. Um, they are only going to be able to represent that one company to you. And typically they earn a pretty generous base salary and there is some motivation um, to earn more money because there will be some uh, bonus per hire or placement that they make. Uh, but that's not going to be the bulk of their, um, uh, that's not going to be the bulk of their income. So it won't have as much of an impact on maybe their motivations for either getting you hired or not getting hired. On the external side, you, you'll also, you'll sometimes hear them referred to as contingency recruiters, agency recruiters, whatever. They're employed by a third party. And that third party is going to, um, uh, you know, be working with the company X for a specific engagement to hire for a specific role or something like that. Typically in this instance, um, the agency, the independent contractor, this third party will be paid based on the pay placement. So when a hire is made, they will likely get anywhere from 20 to 30% of the first year's salary of the person that gets hired. So they actually have motivation for you to get paid more because then their fee is more. But that also can sometimes put them in a place where um, maybe they're trying to get more money than the company is worth paying <laughs> or, or is able to pay and that can like ruin your chances a little bit too, right? So it's good to have an advocate who is trying to get the most money for you in an offer, but sometimes um, it, it just changes, I guess, the motivations uh, behind things. So that's some of how this works. The, the, the other thing that's listed here or not listed here is your internal recruiters are going to know the company inside and out. They're going to know the culture. They're going to know the hiring managers. They're going to know how people tick. They're going to know how decisions are made. And so they're going to be a little bit closer to what, um, they're going to be able to coach you a little bit more than an external recruiter would be able to. External recruiters are going to represent multiple companies at a time. They are very likely going to try to introduce your profile to two, three, four different companies um, because they're hedging their bets, right? They don't care who hires you. They just want you to get hired and they want you to get paid as much as you can um, so that their, again, fee is a little bit higher. But they won't be able to sort of answer those really deep cultural questions about a company and um, really know like how the decision is going to get made. So they can sometimes, um, they're, they're not as like, they're not as, there's not as good of a coach in that sort of prep for your interview. So goods and goods and bads on both sides. Um, the, the bad on the internal side is they're only going to represent that one company, right? And so you're going to be talking to a bunch of recruiters one-to-one -one per company. If you find a good agency, if you find a good group that has, um, a, a lot of companies and a lot of job posts that are relevant to you, then that can actually be a really easy way to, to get your name in your face and your um, resume in front of a bunch of companies at one time. So lots of benefits there too. But point is different motivations, different styles, um, and that can lead to different results. The next thing to know about how recruiters think is we typically think of candidates in two different ways. We think of active candidates, and we think of passive candidates. Active candidates are folks who are um, typically applicants. They're people who are actively searching for a job. They are actively looking for their next thing. Passive candidates are folks that maybe aren't looking for an another job. Maybe they're already employed. Maybe they're not employed. They're just not looking. Um, and those tend to be candidates that would go out and source uh, or referrals that uh, maybe employees or, or other folks will send over to the company. This is important because with active candidates, we expect that you maybe know a little bit more about the company than a passive candidate, right? If you are applying for the job, we would expect you to have done a little bit of research and figured out a little bit about what we do. And, and we would be looking for that in our conversations with you. If we're not getting the sense that you've done the research, we might just be like, well, why are you applying? Like, why, you know, you, you came to me, why are you interested? Whereas on the passive side, we'll know that there will probably be a little bit longer of a sell process for this candidate. We'll need to tell them a little bit more of our story. We'll need to 
um, probably set them up with additional folks to kind of talk about why the company is great. So the process can be a little bit different between active and passive candidates. Um, I don't think there's any real bias for one or the other, and I'll actually get to that. It might actually be the next thing. It is the next thing. Um, so the next thing <laughs> uh, is around diversity recruiting. So especially in the Bay Area, this is like the biggest hot topic in the world. And I think really in a lot of um, industries, companies are really trying to create more uh, diverse teams. Everybody knows the benefits why, nobody's really figured out how, everybody's talking about it. But one of the things we do know is that really small startups, really small companies tend to build their initial teams through the referral channel. And those referral channels are often gonna come from things like, who did I go to college with? Who do I know from this activity that I do? And so you do get a lot of sameness in your candidate pool if you're only looking at referrals. And so one of the first things recruiters will think about is if I wanna make, if I wanna build a diverse team, I need to have a diverse candidate pipeline. And to get a diverse candidate pipeline, one of the easiest things I can do is make sure that my candidates are coming from multiple channels, that I'm getting active candidates, that I'm getting passive candidates, that I'm getting a bunch of referrals, that I'm getting a bunch of applicants, that I'm getting a bunch of sourced um, candidates. So we do try to balance our pipeline and make sure we're getting candidates from all of these different places. Um, I, I will say, Referrals tend to get hired a lot faster than sourced candidates. And so it's really tempting for recruiters to like focus there because when you're trying to hire quickly, you know you can make a placement through a referral a lot easier, but not easier, faster. Faster and easier are not the same, faster. <laughs> um, but that isn't always great. And so the sourced candidates probably are the smallest portion of the full pipeline. Um, but they are uh, probably the most important for creating a diverse team. So that is one thing that we kind of think about all the time. One of the questions is that, that kind of goes the next step further is like, well, how do you, how do you get diverse applicants or how do you get diverse um, sourced candidates? And I'll say that there are a number of specific job boards that are targeted towards different groups of people, right? Um, Power to Fly is an organization who focuses on um, uh, women and building up uh, women in the workplace. And so most of their community is women. The jobs you post there, you know, are going to see be seen by a lot of women. So if you're trying to get more women to your team, you might post on Power to Fly. And there are different job boards like that for just about any subset of folks you can think of. And so that will be one way we would try to diversify our applicant pipeline is to post the job in those specialized areas instead of just throwing it up on LinkedIn. Um, okay. So now we're gonna move into our common misconceptions, our common assumptions, things that people think they know about the recruiting process. <laughs> And the first one is, uh, there's this idea that humans don't read resumes, um, that humans kind of like when you apply to a job online, your resume just goes into this crazy little bucket and a machine looks at it and, you know, screens you in or screens you out. And the truth is there's like really no such thing as an ATS monster that, <laughs> that will screen you in or out. Um, this is an example uh, you know, recruiters talk about this on LinkedIn all of the time, but truly there is no applicant tracking system that is just going through and rejecting people automatically. The one exception to this is you will be able to set up um, screening questions, qualifying questions. So if there's a job description that says explicitly, you must have two years of experience, and then there's a question at the bottom with a checkbox that says, do you have two years of experience and you check no, that probably is going to go to the recruiter with some sort of flag on it. And so the recruiter will still look at it, but they're gonna see the flag that says, this did not pass the screening question. The recruiter may still wanna call you and talk to you and kind of overcome that if there is some wiggle room there. But usually when they put those screening questions on there, it's for a reason. And so the chances are a little, a little less that you would make it through. So you do have to be a little bit careful about um, applications with those screening questions. 
those I have typically see, seen with really high volume roles. So roles that they would expect to see a lot of applicants for. Right now, today, that's basically every job that's open. Um, every job that's open is receiving hundreds, if not thousands of applicants. Um, and so, so there, people are getting, you know, kind of creative with how to screen candidates. Um, with that in mind, um, oh, actually, this is an example. Lever is an applicant tracking system that we use. Every morning, I get an email that says, here are the candidates who applied. Um, I click on those links, I pop them up, I can see their resumes. Like, even if these people were flagged as didn't pass the screening questions, I would still see them. Um, and so there, there, really, there really isn't a, a thing out there um, preventing resumes from getting through to the recruiter. The other kind of kernel of truth here is nowadays there are these systems um, that are AR, AI sourcing tools. So hire tool is a good example where I can go in and I can create a profile for our bioinformatics engineer role. I load up the job description. It asks me to, um, it will, it'll parse out the keywords. It'll ask me to confirm those keywords. I say, yes, 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 I like this. These are the parameters. It will then go out, basically scrape their database and find the candidates that most match what they think we're looking for. I can then go into the candidates and say, yes, this matches, no, this doesn't match, no, this one doesn't match, yes, this one does, yes, this one does. Um, and that will, um, uh, that will kind of continue to learn what the profile is that's the best. And then it will turn up the results and the candidates that are most likely to match my profile. And those would be the ones that I would reach out to when I'm sourcing. So there are robots in the background, <laughs> um, but those robots are being used more for those sourced candidates instead of um, applicants. If you are applying to a job, this likely isn't going to um, impact you. So with most misconceptions, with most assumptions, there's always a kernel of truth somewhere. And so I think this might be where that kernel of truth is coming from, um, but, but they're not really the same thing. So the next misconception is, um, or assumption, because this one actually isn't a misconception, um, the assumption is that recruiters only spend six seconds reviewing a resume. Um, this one is actually pretty close to true. Um, very rarely is a recruiter going to be able to read line by line everything on your resume um, until, especially if they've got hundreds of applicants. And so more often than not, what's happening is we're going through and we're getting that quick visual screen to see, you know, is this, is this even in line with what I'm looking for? And truly, there are applicants that will put their, you know, they'll apply to literally anything, even if they're not even close to um, the job description. So stage one is kind of weed out those, those big ones, uh, the big mismatches. And those are the ones we spend six seconds on. When we're dealing with those high volumes though, typically what we're doing is we're creating some sort of rubric. Um, and so we're putting together the list of the four or five most important things. If I can find those four or five things on your resume in six seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, I'll kind of move you to the next area where I would then spend a minute or two minutes digging in a little bit further to decide, you know, should we give this person a call? Should we move forward from there? The rubrics are sometimes looking for the specific skills in the job description, but more often than not, there are these really general red flags that are kind of, that we're looking for in that first pass. Those red flags are things like large gaps in employment, um, frequent job changes, or a slow career pro progression. So when we talk about gaps in employment, that, that wouldn't be two months here or there, that would be, you know, two years, three years, four years. Um, this is one that unfortunately impacts women more than men uh, because women are more likely to leave the workforce for a while to take care of kids or to take care of other family members. And so most people will look, look for it, but kind of consider it with a grain of salt as well. Um, and I've seen a lot of people also kind of draft resumes in a way that account for that time. Uh, with so that it doesn't look like there's a huge gap on that first pass, right? Because if I'm looking at it and you're like 2000 to 2011, I did this job, 2017 to 2020, I, I would go, whoa, there's six years in there, totally not accounted for. 
Um, but some people would be able to put in like, you know, the 2011, 2016. Um, I've even seen it just be as simple as like left the work workforce for personal reasons. And I'm like, great, cool. I don't need to know the personal reasons, but now I know that like, there's a reason in here and it's not just, um, you had a really bad employer who is, you left on such bad terms with that you won't even put it on the resume, you know, uh, cause that happens too. So account for those gaps if you can. The frequent job changes, um, those are usually changes that are like a year or less. So if you're moving jobs every year or so, that is a huge red flag to hiring managers. Um, it, puts your like loyalty into question. Um, one or two changes usually isn't a big deal. Uh, if you've got six or seven of these in a row though, it becomes a real, a real challenge. The ways folks can kind of handle this is if it's a contract or a short-term project, make that super clear. You know, if you are a serial startup worker, and your one year gaps are because you have consistently chosen companies that ended up being failures and the companies closed down eight months after you started, 10 months after you started, make that super clear on your resume as well. You know, January to October, company closed, you know, major layoff, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Explain those things so that when we see those short jumps, we're, we're not sort of looking at it and saying, this person has no idea what they wanna do, they're just gonna be here for six months and it wouldn't be worth our time to, to keep them around. So again, just try to explain some of those little things. And then this last one is really weird, um, but, uh, but in a lot of ways, hiring managers have an idea in their mind of what someone's career progression should be. And this typically impacts people that are more senior in your career. So if you see someone who's been working for 20, 30 years, and they're still working with like a senior title, not a director title or a VP title, you know, that actually ends up being a flag to folks to say like, how could you have been working this long but not progress further in your career at this point? You know, are you uh, not management material but you're applying for a management role? W what does this mean? What does this look like? That's an area that typically gets flagged and then becomes a point that we have to dig deeper into in the interview process as well. So, um, that one's a little harder to mask, a little bit harder to um, show on a resume the reasons why, but it's definitely one where if you look at yourself and, and recognize, you know, everyone I graduated with or all of my peers are 10 years ahead of me in their career progression, have a reason why and be prepared to talk about it uh, with a recruiter. That's also something you might want to address in the cover letter if you can. So. These are the, the biggest things that we're looking for in that first 10 seconds. The next um, assumption is uh, that we know exactly what we're looking for. It is not true at all. <laughs> Recruiters very rarely know exactly what we're looking for. And that's because a lot of times we're at the mercy of the hiring manager. Hiring managers also rarely know what they're looking for. And so there's definitely in the early part of an interview, this like Goldilocks play of, you know, too little, too big, too hot, too cold, and we're trying to find the person in the middle. So one thing I would say with this is, if you are someone who has applied to a job and you're getting a first call, but you see that the job was just posted a week ago, you might be a test candidate you might not be the perfect candidate. You might just be the one that your um, recruiter is using in a calibration exercise. And calibration exercises are these uh, things that we do with the hiring manager to make sure that we understand what the hiring manager is saying they're asking for and that the hiring manager has an opportunity to sort of change their opinion. And so we're really trying to kind of hone in and calibrate on what this specific position is. Um, all of this is really to say, Again, if you are one of the first 20 applicants, if you see that the job was just posted the other day and you get a call and it doesn't end up working out, do not take that one personally um, because you're very likely still in that Goldilocks game of the hiring manager and the recruiter trying to figure out what is the perfect candidate, what are we really looking for. Um, so I know it rejection sucks in the hiring process and I know that um, you get excited about those first calls, but you'll probably do a lot of first calls um, and you'll probably do a lot 
you'll probably get a lot of no's at that stage. And that's usually because of something like a calibration process. Um, next up, um, another assumption here is that that kind of like formality of your questions, um, you know, they always say like, when you go to an interview, you should have questions for the interviewer, for the person, the hiring manager, the person you're talking to. And I think some people kind of flag that as just like, yeah, sure, I'll have a question, but it's not that important. Um, I'm here to tell you, we are judging you on those questions. <laughs> um, this actually is an area where you can show that you've done your research. You can show that you are aware of what the company's working on. So it could be something like, um, you know, the questions you'll see online are questions like, what do you like about your job and what's your favorite part about the company? And those are fine, but the more interesting questions that we hear and the ones that are stronger, stronger signals to us are things like, um, I noticed on, I noticed on your website that you are, you know, 60% towards your annual goals. Like what's that 40%? What do you, what are you doing to, um, you know, to, to make that jump to, to hit the goals this year? Um, so do the research, look them up and then, uh, ask those questions. The other thing that you can do at this stage, uh, sort of strategically is your recruiter is always throughout the entire process, trying to figure out what is important to you. And sometimes it's really hard for a candidate to say, the most important thing to me is money or you know, the power and control I can get from this job or you know, being able to work with people I like or whatever the reason might be. It's really hard to put words behind that, but we'll start to pick up on the clues based on the questions you ask. So right now, a really common question candidates are asking um, especially in the startup world is what's your runway? You know, how much money do you have? How likely are you to be here in six months? And that's because a lot of people right now are really concerned about stability. They're really concerned about, will this job exist? I need a job that I know I can be at for a while. So we can sense your motivations. We can sense what's important to you through the questions that you ask. And again, it just becomes another signal of if you're asking these really surface level questions, then we're probably going to take that as you not being super interested or really like into this specific company um, more than you're just kind of looking for any job. So these are important. Definitely do your research. Definitely show up with good questions um, and think about how you can use it strategically. Think about how you can use it to signal to the recruiter what you're really looking for. Okay, now I think we're going to go into some tips. Um, and the first one is going to be about resumes. Um, okay. Resumes. All right. <laughs> you want to stand out, but you don't want to stand out too much. <laughs> okay. So every resume in the world is going to look like this. Um, if I've got to look through 20 resumes um, a day to just deal with the applicants we're looking at, all I'm seeing is black and white space. And I'm usually seeing something pretty like pretty jumbled, you know, tight in the space here. Okay. That means they all look the same and I can't remember who is who and who is doing what and what matters where. The opposite side of things is we'll sometimes get these. And this is way too individualized, you know? Number one, like to go from the light to dark is hard on the eyes. Um, my, my progression is in columns. And so I'm kind of jumping around to figure out what's going on. It's just a little bit too much. Um, this is common, this type of resume is common for engineers, um, but, but again, it's or more like design folks, design engineers, um, but, but again, it's a little bit too much. I find that a nice middle zone is something that um, is close to the first, but is also really uh, personalized. Um, there's, there's a resume that I remember seeing probably 10 years ago where the woman had um, I think a purple butterfly behind her name and she like just fully like owned this brand of being a woman like being a purple butterfly person I don't know what that meant to her she I don't remember what the story was but she told me in the interview what it meant like why purple why the butterfly what that story was and so there was just something about that resume where I was like okay, great, this is a unique individual. This is not just another black and white resume, but it's also easy for me to read. So definitely think about those things when you're formatting your resume. Um, you want it to stick out a little bit, but not too much, I guess. 
Um, this is, uh, LinkedIn is a great resource for details. Uh, hiring and promotion is a great hashtag to follow. Um, and they, these are just really, really solid tips across the board. Um, you definitely wanna use bullets when you're putting together your resume, because again, we're scanning, we're looking really quickly to see what the information is. Um, but when you're putting together those bullet statements, really think about, um, does it include uh, information that could be like literally applied to anybody on the planet? You know, um, if it could be applied to anyone in the planet, it's not likely to uh, stick out. If you're a customer service, like customer service agent and you know, you're just saying like, oh, I answer um, customer questions. Yeah, okay, so does every other customer service agent on the planet. Um, what is it about how you do that, what your success is, um, and that, that can make it, make me go, okay, this person really knows what their job is and really knows how to be successful in the job versus just sort of copy and paste over their job description to their resume. That actually um, plays into this next bullet point of focusing heavily on job tasks versus specific results. You wanna focus on those results. You wanna focus on the work that you specifically did versus like the activities that were required of the job. Um, and then, you know, does your resume lack those quantifiable details to help um, boost content value? Similar to the second one, right? You want these bullets to have, de or to have detail, to have, um, to create value and show to the hiring manager, to the recruiter that, um, you know, you know what you're talking about and you're good at the job, not just like, again, capable of explaining what the job is. So look through your bullets and then update them to, to be a little bit more detailed. Um, this next piece, these are, these are actually a couple of my old coworkers that think, um, Alex on the left here. <laughs> is very funny, um, but he also has very good points. Like if your work history doesn't start until page three of your resume, your resume is too long and I'm not gonna look at it. Um, it's just too much. We wanna know the important stuff up top. The second one, listing your work in chronological order is also really important. If you think back to the, the, um, the rubrics and those red flags that we're looking for, we're looking for the story of your career. We're trying to figure out where did you start? What did you do next? How did you get to this next thing? What is the story and narrative behind your whole career? And would this position be a good next natural step in that story and in that narrative? And so putting your, your information, your work history in that chronicle, chronological order makes it really easy for folks to sort of see that progression. This actually also is one thing where those traditional resume rules can kind of throw you off a little bit because you'll see folks work for a while and then go back to school and then go back to work again. And so if I'm just looking at their work experience, I'm seeing a two, three, four year gap while they're in their master's program or something like that. And then I have to jump down to their education or the other education section to see like, oh no, that gap actually was filled by this other thing. So you wanna have those sections, your education section and your work experience section but I think it's also kind of important to, um, you know, maybe put one line in that gap that says, took a break to go to um, grad school, right? And, and sort of kind of keep that narrative going when we're scrolling through and looking at um, the, the, the full kind of path of your career. Um, PDFs, super important. Uh, if, we, if we go back to um, like these types of things, uh, the, the applicant tracking system, the ATS monster, uh, does not parse these very well. Um, two column formats, the, the resumes can get really kind of copied and pasted weirded or weird. Um, and so if it's in a Word document, if you put it in a PDF, it'll come over a lot better. So definitely when you can put it in a PDF, do that. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, the last one's pretty obvious. Make sure your resume and LinkedIn page uh, align that they are telling the same story. Um, we will double check one uh, against the other. Um, and also because a lot of times it's a lot easier for us to share your LinkedIn profile with the hiring managers and the interviewers than it is to share the resume. So I might be looking at your resume, but the hiring manager might look at your LinkedIn. So you want them to have a similar story. Uh, and Will on the right is a nice reminder that we absolutely laugh at people who use the third person in their resumes and cover letters. So do not use the third person. We will 
fully laugh for days about it. Um, <laughs> the next piece is on the cover letter. Um, again, there are a lot of companies who have stopped requiring cover letters as part of the application process. I actually would say, even if it's not required, include one because the, the, the cover letter is your opportunity to give a narrative about where you, where you have been in your career, where you want to go and why you want to go there. It's your opportunity to like humanize yourself uh, because resumes are really pretty inhuman if you think about it. And so customize it to the company. Why are you the right person for this job versus somebody else? Um, and, and that again goes beyond the like, um, I saw in the job description that you're looking for someone that's creative. Well, I'm creative period. And then moving on, like, no, we want more than that. You know, uh, don't tell us you're a hard worker. Don't tell us that, um, you, you know, have whatever other skill that happens to be from the job description really tell us the examples of, um, you know, I'm a hard worker and that's why a month ago when we were faced with this challenge, I did X, you know, give us a story or two, again, humanize yourself, let us see, um, more personality than we're getting in the bullet points. Um, the, this, this other kind of note in here, the don't just, the connect the dots for them. I saw a really interesting conversation on LinkedIn and I couldn't find it again, but there was, um, someone started the conversation basically. Um, I think they, I think they were a new grad. I think they were just finishing like their bachelor's degree or having a hard time finding a job. Um, and they said it really well on LinkedIn of like, yeah, in college I did, um, he, he, he sold cell phones at one of those like T-Mobile booths at the mall where when you're just like trying to get to the next store and somebody's like, hey, 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 can I stop you for a second? Like that was his job and he hustled and that's a hard job. But I don't know what that job is, you know, and I don't know what goes into that. And I don't know the skills required for that job. And so he was trying to get a sales job, a software sales job, but he was getting passed over in a lot of these early screening questions because he hadn't really connected the dots between what is it that makes someone who can stand in a mall and have hundreds of people pass them every day and keep that smile on their face and still continue to try to sell and still continue to like meet their sales goals, right? If you put it in the context of, you know, I did this and it shows my resilience and it shows my ability to push through tricky situations. And here's an example of someone who threw something at me. I don't know, but you know, Recruiters don't magically know every single job out in the world and all of the skills and all of the challenges that come with those jobs. So if you can connect the dots for them and say, I know I don't have the specific experience you're looking for. I do have this experience and this is why that's connected and why I'm still qualified for the job, even though I didn't have the title, you know, X, Y, or Z that you're probably looking for. Um, Recognize rejections are not personal. They really truly are not. Honestly, I still get a pit in my stomach every time I have to tell someone no. Uh, we don't like it. It's not fun. It's the least favorite part of our day. And so it's, it's not personal. Um, thinking back to those calibration exercises, sometimes it really just is part of the process. We just really do have to see live folks. Um, the, the, the secret secret behind here is that Every hiring manager on the planet thinks that there is an exact perfect candidate for every single job, and there is not. There absolutely is not. There is no one that's gonna check every single box that a hiring manager has. And so our job as recruiters is to like get those hiring managers to remove some of those boxes and to remove some of those requirements and loosen up the reins. And so to get them to do that, a lot of times we have to go through this process to say, I have shown you the best of what's available and they are not meeting what you're looking for. So we have to reevaluate what you're looking for. So sometimes you just get caught in that process and, and it stinks, um, but again, it's, it's not personal. Don't give up after a few rejections. You're absolutely gonna get a job eventually. Um, it just usually does take a little bit of time. Um, and then the last, I think this is the last tip. Um, the last tip I will give you is when you're preparing for your interview, don't just prepare for the job interview, but prepare for like a culture interview as well. Especially in startups, especially in small teams, culture becomes really, really important. 
Um, and there are a couple of different things that, that are on a recruiter's mind. The first one is historically companies have always talked about this like culture fit concept, the, the concept of does this person fit into our culture? Uh, that actually has been shown to create a lot of lack of diversity <laughs> um, because if you want someone to fit in, you're looking for somebody that uh, is like the team that you already have. Uh, and what we're wanting is somebody who can add value to the culture, someone who can be a culture add, someone who isn't going to like fight against the current culture, but is going to be able to help level up that culture to the next, to the next thing. So do your research to understand what their company values are, what they are looking for in an individual on that interpersonal side, um, and be prepared to kind of have those conversations about how do you add value? What do you bring to the table um, that can help the team overall? And then uh, the, the common soft skills here, this is, this is almost annoying to me because um, it's so common, but like, companies put together these company values, right? And the values are supposed to be super personal and super relevant to just that company and nobody else would be able to, to say that that's what they are and that's what they focused on and that's what's important to them. And yet, there are a ton of companies whose values are authenticity, right? So it's like, we're trying to be authentic and individual and unique and creative. And by doing that, we're being just like everyone else. So some of, some of the things when you're doing your culture, culture research is thinking about kind of these common things and what they mean. Um, if you see that authenticity value somewhere on their page, really what they're looking for is somebody who like knows who they are and knows what they want, um, is willing to like say those things um, and is willing to like hold other people accountable as well uh, to, to them being themselves. It's, it's the idea of employers wanting people to bring their whole selves to work and not just the work part of themselves to work. So that's usually what people are looking for when they're talking about authenticity. Um, the other really big trend right now is um, being on, being solution oriented. Um, the, 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 the startup world has created its own monster. Um, entitlement is a huge sort of thing or topic of discussion in the, in the backgrounds of a lot of companies. Um, when all of these amazing perks started to be the norm, all of these employees started to expect there to be the ping pong tables and like all of the free time and these ridiculous benefits and all of this stuff that's amazing. And now companies are realizing like, oh my gosh, like we can't actually keep doing, like we can't do this. Not all companies can do this, but it's now an expectation. And in that same kind of idea, um, there are a lot of managers, a lot of middle managers who are looking at their individual contributors and seeing that they're great at identifying problems and then dumping it on their laps and just creating more work for them. And so what a lot of people are looking for is folks who can say, I've identified a problem, I've identified a potential solution, this is why I think it will work, and with your permission, we will uh, you know, put this solution into place. So knowing how important that is right now to hiring managers, um, I would keep that in mind when you're putting together like answers to questions, right? If you are gonna go into an interview, you're gonna get some questions, think about how can you answer this in a way that shows that you're not just somebody who identifies the problem, but can also um, come to the table with some solutions. So those are the two kind of soft skills that are weirdly important right now um, and probably aren't talked about a whole lot. So um, I think the last piece is uh, do not self-reject, right? Um, if you don't think you deserve the job, apply for it anyway. If you don't think your article is good enough, publish it anyway. If you don't think they'll reply to your email, send it anyways. Don't self-reject. We are more than capable of rejecting people on our own. We don't need you to reject yourself. Um, and and there's a, there are a lot of studies too showing, especially when it comes to applicants, you know, um, I think the statistic is something like men are likely to apply for jobs if they meet 50 or 60 percent of the criteria on the job description whereas the threshold for women is something like 80 or 90 percent 
Um, they feel like they have to be 100% fit for the job to be able to apply for it. And that really just isn't true, partially because it goes back to this idea of we don't really know exactly what we want when we post that job the first time around. We put what we think we want um, and it's a good starting point, but usually the later on in the interview process we get, the more those requirements really loosen up. And so if you know that those are not hard and fast rules, hopefully it'll make it easier to, to apply when you um, meet most of the requirements or a good chunk of the requirements. Um, but the, the, the message here is like, don't, don't opt yourself out. Um, it, 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 you know, we can, we can do it for you. Um, with that, I think that's the end of my slides, the end of the very, very, very long winded diatribe, but, um, I'm happy to chat and answer questions about anything that, uh, that I brought up if anyone wants to. So I'm going to actually stop the share. Cool. Any thoughts? Questions? I have a question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, so I've always been kind of weirded out by the, the language that you use in the resume where you kind of like avoid the word I when mm. describing your work. And mm. I've never really understood the reason for that. It always feels awkward typing or writing that way. I'm wondering if you could kind of help me out and explain that. Yeah. So that goes into the, the thing that most people are looking forward, looking for, which is the, um, the team mindset, right? You know? If I only use I in all of my statements, then I'm not attributing any of my success to the people around me. It tends to kind of show maybe they don't collaborate well, maybe they aren't a team player or something like that. And so that's, I think, why a lot of people get the um, recommendations like don't use I, you know, or, or do use I. It's going to be something kind of in the middle. For that instance, I would actually probably look at the job description and look at like what does seem to be important. If you're seeing words like teamwork, collaboration, um, working with others, those would be ones where I would probably draft your, your, your statements in a way that shows exactly what you did and then how that impacted like the team overall. Um, because that becomes the, the next question, especially in really senior roles. A lot of times JVs on senior roles will look like, or applicants for senior roles will just be like, the company did this. And we'll go, great, the company did that, but what were you specifically responsible for? So it's about striking that balance of, you know, I built the process the sales team used to achieve a 20% growth um, year over year or something like that. So it's a way to show the whole team was in it. I was specifically responsible for X, Y, or Z. Does that kind of help? Yep, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's all a balance. <laughs> I have a question too. So in terms of like, you know, for me, I think about the first time I was trying to get out of like, you know, wooden tables and into more corporate America setting. Um, back then we could actually just go visit people, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, not have to keep distance. But I mean, what do you recommend about that? So like in terms of you apply for something, you know, is there an appropriate time to follow up? It, when does it become desperate? I guess. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So this is actually a very good question. Very rarely is it going to get desperate. More often than not, what's happening is you got buried in somebody's email inbox. <laughs> and so um, more often than not, we're like, oh yeah, we forgot about that one. You know, I'm so glad they followed up. We'll, we'll usually never be mad about a follow-up. We'll be mad about a follow-up if we're like very explicitly, you are not a fit for this position. And then a week later, you're like, did you change your mind yet? That might annoy us, um, but, uh, but for the most part, um, I think following up is fine and does show some of the eagerness. That does remind me, one of the things I forgot to mention in here is that if you, especially for career changers, folks who are moving into a new industry or um, you know, just maybe even to a new uh, geographical market, um, you probably know that your profile is not going to look like the profile that your hiring manager is looking for, that the recruiter is looking for. But you may know that those connections exist. And so in those situations, you should absolutely feel free to like submit the application, go to LinkedIn, find the recruiter, and reach out to that recruiter directly and say, hey, 
I just applied to this role. I thought it was really interesting. I wanted to call your attention to it. Um, I know it might not look like a traditional sort of profile, but I believe I can ABC, you know, uh, pull some of this stuff from your cover letter to really, you know, surface that up to the top because there are a lot of applicants. And when we get behind, sometimes it can be a week. I've got some applications that are probably a month or more old right now. And I feel terrible about it. Um, but it takes me six hours to schedule an onsite interview. So, um, so it's really hard to kind of manage your time when, when, um, a lot of times the recruiters focus, um, this is actually a thing recruiters learn very early, uh, which is your, your focus and your priorities should be in, in the agency world. It's closest to the money is the phrase they use. And so the candidate closest to the money is the one you prioritize. Those would be the ones who are at offer stage or at onsite stage or really late in the interview process, which means people earlier in the process are getting less of a look. Um, in the internal world, that's similar. It's not the money because they're not you know, paid on a contingency fee, but it is um, you know, the folks that are more likely to close faster. So our onsite candidates uh, do get a, a little bit more attention than others. So when we've got a lot of candidates late in the funnel, um, late in stages, um, yeah, we, we put a lot of our time there and sometimes we get backed up with applicants. So yes, reach out, follow up. Usually we won't be mad. If we are mad, most recruiters will let you know. Questions, <laughs> <laughs> sir? Cool. Well, Any thoughts from anybody else? <clears throat> Can't cool. say I appreciate this, especially today. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, we, I don't know. I know people probably need to talk about it, <laughs> but I don't need to <laughs> make people talk about it. Um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, this has been interesting. Hopefully, again, it gives you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at kind of what recruiters are thinking about when they're going through the whole process and some of the little things you can do um to to kind of adjust your resumes your cover letters and how you approach people because there are little things that can help make you stand out yeah and we we are recording this and we're going to share it to everybody so um i'll probably end up sending it again on monday as the uh, part of our weekly haps and then going forward we're going to start doing more of these and recording them so that way folks are you know stuck in a meeting and whatnot they can catch the replay afterwards yep we'll have a little bit of a library yes cool. Cool, cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, again, hope it was helpful and I will see you all later sometime. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, everybody. Stay positive. Yes. <laughs>